fly here, I think. Um, some of you may be familiar with David Berry, who's a award-winning columnist for the Miami Herald. And he wrote uh, a column one day called 16 Things It Took Me 50 Years to Figure Out. I want to share four of them with you. You will never find anybody who can give you a clear and compelling reason why we observe daylight savings time. <laughs> I still can't figure it out either. I the one thing that, unless all human beings, the one thing that uh, unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, and ethnic background, is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. <laughs> you ever heard someone, when they got in an accident, say it was my fault? It doesn't happen too often. If you had to identify in one word the reason why the human race has not achieved and will never achieve its full potential, that word is meetings. Okay. Not conferences, but meetings. Yes. This one I like, not meant to be funny, but I think it has a lot of truth. A person who is nice to you but rude to the waiter is not a nice person. And then I would like to add this one. Listen to your elders and those in the trenches. And that's the reason that I'm so honored to be here and excited to be here. You folks are my heroes. And the founders and the people that are involved in CCDA are people that encouraged me and got me started in what I have been working in in the past few years. And so I appreciate being here a great deal. Today I'm going to talk about race, particularly taking a step back and looking at what does it mean in our society and how does that in turn affect what happens in the communities that you're working in. And uh, got a slideshow here. OK, there it goes. Um, the focus will be on transforming the racialized society. I'm going to briefly review this book called Divided by Faith. And then I'm going to go on to the newer research we've been doing uh, and try and share that with you as well. The book, uh, if you want to summarize it, can be summarized in this way. It's a story of how well-intentioned people, their values, and their institutions actually recreate the racial division that they oppose. Uh, Christianity Today, when they did an article on it, they summarized it as the story of how white American evangelical theology uh, frustrates racial healing. And to that I would add, frustrates justice. To get to this story, I first have to set up the context. And that context that he used is something called the racialized society. The racialized society affects us all, and I want to give a little definition and then give some examples. What is it? By, I've defined it as a society where race matters profoundly for differences in our life experiences, our life opportunities, and who we hang out with, who we know, who we enjoy being with. can also define it as a society that allocates rewards, economic, social, political, even psychological, unequally by race. Well, are we really racialized? Its form has changed, and because it changes, people assume since we no longer have what we had, it is no longer with us. We started out in slavery. We had Jim Crow segregation. We move on to de facto segregation and inequality. Its form changes, but what's its essence is what I had on the screen. Some examples. Are we really racialized? If we look at marriage, we do not marry people randomly in our country. We marry people almost always within the categories that are defined for us as being our race. If we look at just black and white, which is the most dramatic difference, less than 2% of white folks and less than 2% of black folks marry somebody of another race. So it doesn't happen too often. In our neighborhoods, drive around any major, major metropolitan area and you will t be able to see that race matters for where people live. Segregation has been a uh, very constant residential segregation in the last hundred years or so. In the last ten years, the latest census data has shown, in the metropolitan areas where most minorities live, there's been no change in segregation in the last ten years. Um, in fact, for Hispanic and for Asians, compared to where they're living with whites, they've actually become more separated over the last ten years. When you look at what's, where children are living, I think this is the most discouraging. That's actually increased. White children, black children, Asian children, and Latino children live further apart from each other now than they did 10 years ago. 
In our housing, we have inequality. We know that. If you are going to purchase a house, it matters what race you are. If you're not white, you can expect to be turned down about two to three times more often, even when you have the exact same income and profile as in your background, same credit history. Um, you can expect to pay higher interest rates when you do get a loan. It's not legal, but it happens all the time. You can uh, expect that you will have uh, more people, excuse me, that you will have, well, let me put it this way. 75% of white Americans own homes, less than half of all other Americans own their homes. And this has to do with a much degree of dis discrimination, paying more, higher interest rates, having to get worse deals to get homes. Uh, in education, there's a brand new study that just came out. I found it fascinating. R the way they try to figure out who's actually graduating from high school is they take telephone surveys, and it's a very ineffective way. Somebody named J.P. Green, who's at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, he actually did a huge sample across the nation and sampled eighth graders and just followed them. And he followed them for five years, giving them an extra year to finish. What he found is that well over 80% of white Americans graduated in that five years, but only 56% of African Americans, only 54% of Latinos, and approximately the same amount for American Indians. So here we are in a nation where at a minimum you have to have a high school degree, and about half are not getting it. Uh, criminal justice, we could go on and on about the inequalities there. Arrested more often, if you're a minority, but also charged, also uh, given stiffer sentences when convicted. You're convicted more often, more likely to give, be given the death penalty. If we look in our boardroom, one way I like to summarize this to my students is take the 500 largest companies in the United States. These are the most powerful companies. And if you wanted a random sample of the CEOs, for example, African Americans, 60 of those 500 CEOs should be African American. In fact, it's zero. It oscillates between one and zero. Ninety-seven percent of all CEOs of these companies are uh, Anglo, usually male. Unemployment, since we've been tracking it in the 1940s, the rate between minority, specifically African American and white, has been two to one. African Americans are twice as likely to be unemployed as whites. It doesn't change. It goes the same. So no matter what happens to the economy, the two lines go like this, always together. Always that inequality built into the system. Then we have a whole bunch of, whole slew of other things. Income, wealth, health, life, death, and so on. The way I summarize this is, what does it cost to be minority in the United States? It costs you 40% of your income, 90% of your wealth, and five to 10 years of your life. Then there are things that are more culturally based, our music, our TV watching, and as we've spoken already this morning, where we worship are very separated. You take the top 20 programs in the United States, typically white and blacks, and they can only track white and black at this point, or that's all that they do. We find that we share the top 20 programs and usually one or two. Monday Night Football is usually one that we're both watching, and uh, something like Touched by an Angel, somewhere where there's a mixed race cast. Otherwise, completely separate in what we're watching. In fact, the very top shows for African Americans are the last three shows, less frequently watched shows by white Americans. Um, and then, of course, religious affiliation. I'm going to get more into that um, very shortly. So this racialized society we have is something that we're born into. It's the context we're given. It's part of what you're all working against trying to overcome. It has to be changed, but here it is. We're given it. This whole inequality obviously has to grieve God. So to understand it, to know first of all that it's there, and then to figure out what it needs to be changed. How can we actually overcome this thing that has been with us since we have begun as a nation? It's got to be a central focus. Now, we wanted to do a study of what is actually happening out there. What are people thinking about this issue? If you study what, just look at what's happened in evangelical America, there's just been this explosion of interest and activity of, uh, in terms of racial issues. So we've got books written and there are uh, organizations formed and there are uh, college courses offered and 
there's apologies given by denominations and there's all of this activity going on on the issue of race what actually is happening what are people thinking to get at that we had to do uh, come at it from a variety of ways so in historical analysis we looked at evangelical publications we interviewed 2,500 Americans by telephone then from that group we went to the homes of 200 people in 23 different states and I got real tired of traveling but there was no better way to really see the context that people were living in talk to them went to worship with them and then also use other data that was available so here we have this explosion of activity so much happening what are the people in the pews the grassroots evangelicals what are they thinking I'll be coming to what I just put up on the slide here in a moment let me introduce that one of the things we did is ask do you think in our country we have a race problem and if people thought there was a race problem, and they often did, what the race problem was, was this. First of all, they minimized the race problem. Second of all, if there is a race problem, they would typically blame the media or minorities for the race problem. So what is the race problem? I want to share the story of Debbie, someone that we mentioned in the book. By almost any definition, Debbie White, and 27 years of age, is an evangelical. She holds firmly to the authority of scriptures, is born again, evangelizes with her words and actions, gives money to overseas missions, and is active in her church. She recently graduated from an evangelical college and is now training to be a Christian education director in her denomination. She has spent her whole life within the white evangelical subculture. We met her for an interview in a restaurant on a Saturday morning. Throughout the discussion, she was very open and friendly, candidly stating her thoughts on a variety of issues. In fact, she was so candid at this restaurant and stating her issues her, her, her thoughts on issues like abortion and such. And the people behind her kept turning around. And finally, in just total anger, they just stomped out of the restaurant. They couldn't take it anymore. So finally, when we did these interviews, we talked for about an hour, and then we would get into questions about race. So I finally turned to that question and said, uh, do you think our country has a race problem? And she said, I think we make it a problem. Well, how do we make it a problem? Well, to me, she said, people have problems. I mean, two white guys working together are going to have arguments once in a while. Women are going to have arguments. It happens between men and women, between two white guys and two white women. People are going to have arguments with people. I feel like when an argument happens, say, between a white guy and a black guy, instead of saying, hey, there's two guys having an argument, we say, hey, it's a race issue. So the race problem for Debbie is really just one of mis misinterpretation. Is there anything beyond that? And she said, yes. Sometimes people judge people out of ignorance, truly, just totally based on their skin color. And that is both rare and inexcusable for Christians. And she, doesn't, she mentioned that she doesn't see much of it, but she hears about it on the news. OK, so the focus of the race problem here is being between individuals, not getting along. That was incessant. I could give you hundreds of quotes on that. Uh, this one man, I'm not going to read 100 quotes, but I'll read one more. Uh, this Presbyterian man said, I think our country has a perceived race relations problem. I think we have individuals still that have race problems. I don't think the country has in its current form a race problem. So what's going on here? One of the keys of one of my tasks as a professor is to figure out why are people saying what they're saying when you hear things in such common frequency what's going on when you think about white American evangelical theology where salvation comes one heart at a time we're saved one heart at a time and we develop a relationship with Christ so it's me and it's Christ my God and these things we argue are so emphasized that people take them and use it to understand the rest of the world and they put those lenses on and that's how they see issues so I have on here what I call cultural tools. The three main cultural tools that white American evangelicals seem to be using over and over and over. First one, accountable free will individualism. It's a very big term. It says this, individuals exist independent of social structures and institutions, and they're individually accountable for their freely chosen actions. So, Whatever I do is because I chose it. I'm not affected by anything outside of me because I exist only as an individual 
and I do not believe or do not see structures that might influence my choice. From this perspective, it makes sense what uh, one Baptist man told me. He was talking about what he perceived to be problems in the African American community, and he said blacks have really dropped the ball when it comes to family responsibility for raising their children. I hate it that kids have to suffer for that, but the kid's responsibility is to say, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm going to freely choose, as this child, not to follow the way of my parents. The second one is relationalism. And again, from our theology of this relationship as being the central core of being a Christian, relationship with Christ, this gets uh, used again and again. Just define it as attaching central importance to interpersonal relationships. Therefore, when you do that, what happens is that you understand all social problems as problems between individuals, as bad relationships. That's ultimately what sin is. It's either the individual or it's bad relationships. Race problem to the degree it exists is sin. In the minds of the evangelicals we talk to, that sin is people not getting along with one another. So we need to get along with one another. A correlate of this very important one is anti-structuralism. The idea that there can be nothing beyond the individual or beyond individual, two individuals relating to one another. There is no system or systems out there. And that fact is things that made them quite angry. They'd often talk about like the government trying to change something or anybody working at a system level as being artificial, as being fake, as not being changing the heart, therefore it can't work. So evangelicals take these, they transpose them, they generalize them, and they use it to understand race. One of the things this meant is that when you talk about the race problem as being anything beyond individuals, they're completely puzzled, they get angry, and they're angry at, white evan or at black evangelicals, they're angry at Latino evangelicals, anybody that will bring up the possibility that there's something beyond individuals, because you're violating the very core of their faith. So you're challenging them at the very heart of who they are. So they call such notions lies, a facade, and not addressing the true problem. Even when we asked directly, couldn't think beyond the individual level. Um, we asked this evangelical, is your perception that it bo mostly boils down to your attitude, to attitudes, or do you see this race problem also in the legal system and the job market? Kind of a more structural problem, as far as you know. As far as I know, I would say it's an individual attitude. That's my experience. Again, there's this reliance on, since that's what I experienced, it's true. Uh, sometimes it appeared like people were seeing beyond, but if we questioned further, they couldn't see beyond the individual level. Do you view this mostly as an attitudinal thing, or do you view prejudice and discrimination as having, having affected the legal system and housing patterns? Is it institutional or individual? It's individual, individual attitude, but it affects larger areas. It affects the system. It's within our government because our politicians are acting as individuals. So again, cannot think of an entity acting on its own accord. Now, we found some evangelicals that didn't talk this way. Most of the non-white evangelicals we talked to didn't speak this way. In fact, as was very common when you ask, is there a race problem, probably the most common response was laughter, just like that. By the way, I just, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but standing up with this fancy background, I feel like I'm on TBN television, so. <laughs> what did the people that, that spoke differently about race have in common? And I specifically want to focus on white evangelicals. We didn't find many, but we found some that didn't speak in the ways that I've just been talking about. The thing they had in common was extensive networks across race. They had a different experience, a different lived life. Um, I'm going to share with you um, a person named Carol who actually interviewed in the great city of Chicago, but I'm not supposed to say that. Yeah, <laughs> my birthplace. See. She was raised in an isolated white community, small town, but 
she married an African-American man, and they were living in all African-American area of Chicago. And I asked, when I asked her if there was a race problem, she, like many of the non-whites, she laughed. And she said, of course there was a race problem. Specifically, she said this, oh yeah, oh yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> the white people think they are superior. Not all of them, but some of them. They think they're better. Why? Because they got better upbringings, better advantages? That doesn't mean there's something wrong with black people. The race problem, she said, is really, really scary. She had this to say when we asked her about her daughter and her adjusting to this new life, which she had been living for a while, but wanted to know what she thought about living in the neighborhood she was in. I'm adjusting to it. I think my daughter sometimes finds it hard because she's mixed. They call her cracker. Crackers are white. They call her Puerto Rican because she doesn't look like she's totally black. You know when people resent her, but I do think that I'm probably better off in a black neighborhood. I am more openly accepted than if my husband were to move in an all-white neighborhood. I think there would be hell to pay there. Now, whether you think that's correct or not, that assessment, what's important here is how differently she's talking. Not only that she knows and perceives a race problem, but also that she's talking about individual relationships and something even greater than that. In the words that I have mentioned here, she's mentioning inequality, that it matters what neighborhood you live in, that that will have implications depending on your race, that there's a sense of group position, that some people have more power, and some people, in her mind, think they're better than. So all of these things give a very different perspective to her understanding of race. So I can't emphasize enough what the role that isolation, segregation in our culture, in our society plays. It's that crucible that allows us to have this division continue generation after generation. I'll give you an example that I've seen in my own life. In, I used to teach at an all-white university. And so when I would teach race and ethnic relations, sometimes 99% would be white, but usually 100% would be white. And when I would speak, my students would listen, take the tests, but they knew I was just some sort of ranting, in their mind, liberal professor, and they knew the truth, so they'll just feedback what they need to say. Where I teach now at Rice University, 35% non-white. In my race and ethnic, always about 65% non-white of all different groups. When we're talking and going through the, the, the class, the white students will sometimes raise their hand and, and start speaking in these ways, that race isn't really an issue, we're making too much of it, and guess what happens? <laughs> the other two-thirds of the class whoosh, they're going to tell about their own life experience and give examples. And all of a sudden, it's not just me saying something, it's a reality. And I see the students have to change the way that they think and the way they perceive. And many students will come and say how much the class totally changed their life. And they get involved in different ways. OK, how am I doing here? I got to I got to move. I'm going to. Look at that, how slow that comes on. I've got these, a couple of chapters in the book, and I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail here, but it looks specifically at why are we separated in our churches, and what are the implications for it? And there are really incredibly far-reaching implications. Just for example, one, white evangelicals are more likely to work in all white places of employment. And we go through the book of why that would stem from where you're going to church. How could that be related? Okay, so to conclude what the book is about, summarize this argument that despite the good intentions and much activity and energy, white evangelicalism does more to perpetuate the racial divide and the inequality than it does to reduce it. So it's rather ironic that people are putting the effort, but because they're not thinking about where to put that effort, it's actually counterintuitive effort, or the result is. I want to turn now to the research we've been doing for the last couple of years, and that's on multiracial congregations. Trying to understand why do they form, when do they form, how often do they form, what makes them difficult, what makes them, what do people say is excellent about them, what do they love about it, what sort of inner, inner dynamics are new because it's a multiracial congregation. And I've been doing this work for the last couple of years with uh, Professor uh, George Yancey from University of North Carolina. 
University of North Texas, who is here today, and I couldn't resist bringing his picture here with me. So that's him, man. I wanted to embarrass him. All right. What is a mixed race congregation? We had to have a definition, and that definition that we chose is one in which no racial group is 80% or more of the congregation. And I didn't choose that haphazardly. The reason we chose that definition is that in studies of other organizations, and church is in many ways an organization, in studies of other organizations, 20% is the point of critical mass where that group or groups can actually have an influence on the larger organization itself. And it also mathematically means at that point you have a 0.99 probability of encountering someone of another race. So it's also at that point where you almost cannot avoid people of another race. Okay, so using that definition, taking a national random survey of uh, congregations, about 12 to 1300 of them, how many whether they're Christian or any other faith, that this first slide is all, how many of them are racially mixed at that 80% level? 7%. So 93% do not meet that requirement. Now it varies dramatically by re religion and tradition within that religion. And one of the things, as I put it up here, we'll talk about why it would vary this much. Who's most frequent? Non-Christians. About 28% of their congregations are racially mixed. Catholic, 15%. Protestant, 5%. Why is it so different? Well, there's all sorts of reasons, but one of the things is that, sort of uninteresting, but the smaller your group, the more likely you are to be mixed because you have less choice. So Protestantism being the dominant tradition in the U.S., you can go to a black church or a white church or a Korean church and so on. So you have lots of choice. If you're a Muslim, you end up usually having to go to the mosque that's there. Just a little bit more information about these churches. Um, within these churches, 62% have two groups in them. And what I'm going to use here is that you have to have at least 10% of a group. So 62% have at least two groups. 29% of these congregations have three groups. And then 9%, the remaining 9%, actually have four different groups, at least 10% of four different racial groups. Uh, a lot of times when people talk about multiracial churches, they may be thinking black-white. Just that, that model, black-white, is just 13% of churches fit that category. The most common is white, Latino, Asian. Those three together, 27% of all mixed churches are that. 21% uh, are white and Latino only. And then the next largest is white, black, and Latino. Latinos are very likely to be in mixed churches, and Asians, to my surprise, are very likely. Almost half of Asians, particularly if they're second generation or more, are in mixed-race churches. I've got up here, I'm going to give you some data. We, we wanted to see, are the people that go to mixed churches versus those that go to other churches any different from each other? And we asked them a variety of questions, and this is going to be one of them. This one, I think, we just had to check. It should be true, but we had to make sure. We asked them, of, the, of your friends in the church, how many are of all your race, etc.? So this is those, the percent that said, most or all of my friends in my church are my race. So in not, the non-mixed churches, 87% said that was true. Look at how different it is in the mixed churches, just 28%. So it's a very large difference. I imagine we'd expect that, but we want to make sure that people are actually meeting people and making friends in these churches, and indeed they are. And you can see for each racial group that that holds. So it's a universal effect. We also asked them, just think of all your friends. So we're not talking about church now, just your friends in general. And we want to get at what is the racial mix there. And again, this huge difference. Most of the people in non-mixed churches, most of their friends are their same race, whereas the minority of those in the mixed churches would say that. So there's this integration going on. One thing that I'm concluding in studying this is that there's really a sixth American out there. We think of the five largest racial groups as being the five categories in which you must choose one and be in it. But I think there's a growing sixth choice, which many of you would be in, and that is integrated networks. You're part of many groups at once and many cultures. Social networks. We ask, think of all the people that you know, spend time with in your neighborhoods, in your schools, in your places of employment, anywhere you can think of. 
What is the racial mix? Again, this dramatic difference for those that go to mixed churches and those that are not in mixed churches. 73% versus 26%. And again, for each racial group, ever dated, now we're going to get into the scary part. It matters. Rather dramatically, again, about a quarter of people that do not attend mixed churches say they've ever dated someone of another race. And by the way, these are going to be, uh, people tend to exaggerate because of social desirability. So the difference may be greater yet. But it, it grows to 62%. The majority of people in these mixed race congregations say they've dated someone of another race at some point. And you can see if, if you look at the racial groups, even whites, a little over half say that. So it's rather dramatic. How about the big one, being interracially married? This, again, just 2%. When we talk about our country being so divided in, in terms of marriage, it's mostly people in non-mixed churches. And then in mixed churches, we have over a quarter saying that they're interracially married. Look at Asians, 60% that are in mixed churches are married. Now, this may bring up something for you. What's causing what? Is it that you had interracial networks, you were interracially married, and so you look for a church that was mixed? Or is it that you went to a mixed church, and you made new friends, and you met somebody special, and what happens? Well, we've been doing that qualitatively, visiting churches around the country and interviewing people, and the answer is it's both. That almost always, there's something going on before. They have a little bit more comfort being in mixed churches, or with mixed cultures, and that grows dramatically when they get to the church. So it's both. We did look at what people's contact when they were growing up, and we did find differences. Those that go to mixed churches said they were more, they were more likely to have gone to a mixed school or lived in a mixed neighborhood. These are important. So when we're raising our children, just one of these two experiences makes a dramatic difference in what they'll be as adults. Just completed a paper that's going to be published uh, in a few months, looking at if you went to a mixed school, went to a, lived in a mixed neighborhood, at any point in your life growing up, what is your life like in terms of interracial contacts when you grow up? Just incredible differences. So giving kids that mixed experience can make a dramatic difference. Does it matter in terms of the church being mixed and what's going to happen for people? One of the things I can do, and I spared all the numbers, but I can control for the effect. Well, if I take out the effect of what their experience was growing up, are they still more likely to have more friends of another race if they go to a mixed church? And indeed, they do. So there's something that happens in these mixed churches that changes the whole social network of people. And one thing that seems to be true is it's the single strongest predictor of what people's networks are going to be. There are some difficulties and costs of being in these churches, too, and it's very important that we think about them, because if we can know them, we can deal with them. One of the things built into the very structure or the law of numbers is this hypothesis here. Dominant group members, and by that I mean the largest group within the church, they should have a higher percentage of their friends who are the same ethnicity as them when compared to minority group members. Think of ten people, nine are... Latino, one is Asian. That Asian friend makes one friend across race. Then they're going to have a much higher percent of their friends being across race than for the Latinos. So it's just built into the numbers. I've got six hypotheses here that we wanted to test. And to do this, we selected a, a church in California. Because we wanted to not mix and confound dominant group experience outside the church and in, we chose a church where whites were not the majority. So in this particular church in California, about 150 members, it's 55% Filipino, 30% Anglo, 10% Hispanic, and then the remainder are African American and uh, other Asian groups. So we tested this. Who's going to have most friends? It should be the largest group. This is what we found. 84% of the Filipinos said my very best friend in the church is also Filipino. Whereas for the non-Filipino members, just 48% said this. What we did was ask them to tell us their three best friends in church. We actually made them rank them. That was kind of mean, but they did it for us. <laughs> and then we looked across at compare number one friend, number two friend, number three friend. You can see that 
These differences are large, and they fit the hypothesis. So flowing from that is the second hypothesis, that dominant group members should be more likely to report that their closest friends, be they in the church or not, are actually within the church, rather when you compare them to what minority group members say. Now, why is this? Again, you use that example of the nine and the one. If you're going to have friendships in your own race, friendships with people like you, or however you want to define that, what happens is you tend to look outside of the organization to find that because it's harder for you to find it within. So you, have, you can think of it as the core people and the fringe people. We tested that and again found that. For Filipinos, the majority, we did the same thing. Who are your three best friends in the church? Who are your three best friends outside the church? Rank them. Now, think of your best friend in the church and your best friend outside the church. Which one of those is your really best friend? And the answer for Filipino members, more often than not, was the one in my church. And you can see the reverse for those that were the non-Filipino, more often outside of my church. When people speak of gains, what the benefits of being in a church like this, we hypothesized that they would talk about abstractions, things like harmony, unity, and diversity. But when they spoke of costs, they'd get to the nitty-gritty and say they can't, they really struggle with that worship song that they sing or the way that we organize or the preaching style. Or Why is that? Because it's easier to hold together abstractions. That's why the U.S. can work quite a bit. We, we live by abstractions, freedom, unity, justice, and it can mean anything to anybody. And I can make it work for me because it can fit my definition. When we actually have to get together and apply those, that's when the division can come forth. And that's why we think when they talk about costs, they'll be very specific about those costs. Okay, I want to share what they talked about here. Well, I can't find my notes. We'll go on to four. Uh, here we go. You're very patient. Well, we talked to them and asked them what they liked about the church, and there was a strong tendency to like the racial mix. That came up almost always. I appreciate that it's a multi-ethnic church. I've never seen a church like this before. It's like a church is supposed to be, the body of Christ all together. All the other churches I've been to have been just one ethnic group. That's a Filipino male, an Hispanic male. It's a taste of heaven on earth to have people from all these different backgrounds worshiping together. I feel like my worship of God is so much more pure and authentic when I look up and see all the people and nations represented. And an Anglo-American female. It's truer to the biblical model of 1 Corinthians with the body of Christ. We need each other, and it's an example to the world. Interestingly, the, the, the benefits of being in these churches were so great, we also interviewed the people that left. We were able to find and track down four people that left. Three of those four were so taken and excited about that, the multi-ethnic worship, that they were now looking or already in another multi-ethnic church. So it didn't work out for them where they were, but they weren't willing to give up on that dream. It was one thing that comes across when we talk to people in these. Something happens that makes them excited. They find it hard to communicate it, but there's something deep and rich. It gets into their blood, and they don't want to give it up. When the dominant group members, and this is hypothesis four, talk about costs, the focus should be on conflict arising from worship and other concrete practices rather than a lack of social attachments. Why? Because of hypothesis one. They can easily make friends because they are the dominant group. It's, it's less boundaries to cross for them. And indeed, that's what we found when they talked. They talked about, we kind of fight sometimes over worship. I don't understand why it has to be such a big deal. It makes it a little harder, things like that. For the minority group members, we expect a couple of different things. They're going to talk more about costs than majority group members do because they have that added issue of having to cross, make the, take the initiative and cross boundaries to get social relationships and also use it because of the worship style and perhaps the whole structure of the church are run by the majority group. Uh, here it was just dramatic. They ex perceived these churches in very different ways. 
This is non-Filipinos uh, talking about what, how, what they found difficult in the church. The founders of the church have a really tight group. I have at different times been disillusioned by the difficulty fitting in. Uh, this is a Kenyan female. I'm an extrovert and get to know people easily, but I feel shut out. An Anglo-American female. For a long time, I didn't have friends at the church. I felt really out of place. I tried to understand the Filipino mentality and relate to it, but I couldn't. I was trying to fit in. I even started to dress like them and talk like them, but I just couldn't fit in. An African-American female. The church seems kind of friendly at first. People come and they talk to you and they try to remember your name, but when you decide to become a member of the church, you have to do all the work to get into the in-group. I'm an outgoing person and I'm really adaptable. I get to know people pretty easily, but at this church, it's a totally different story. It's like you hit a wall, and I have to totally extend myself to get to know people. So they're talking about these things that we're talking about in the hypothesis. They're experiencing these things because of the incongruence in the size of the different groups. Um, 14 of the 17 non-Filipinos we talked to, when we asked them if there were any costs, brought up relationships, how hard it was. None of the Filipinos brought that up. They all said that wasn't a problem at all. So they are in the same church, the same organization, and they're perceiving the world in a very different way. As leaders of organizations that are multiracial, you have to go the extra mile. We talk about the homogenous units principle, that it's easier and more effective to be in our separate groups. It's easier. I don't know if it's more effective. But we don't care, as our leaders right here will tell us, easy, comfort, that is not our goal. In our church, I'm in a multiracial church, and uh, we talked about some of these things. An African-American man and a Latino man got so into it that what they've done is they've created a fringe list. They actually have a list of the people that they would see as being on that fringe instead of the core, and they keep that list, and we plan activities, and anytime we do anything as a church, those two men have taken it upon their hearts to specifically and personally call the fringe list and invite those people to shake their hand on Sunday morning, to talk to them, to be the ones so that they're the ones extending themselves and not requiring the fringe people to do all of that, trying to enlarge the core, bring people into the center. So that's one way that you can deal with that. I was going to talk, I'm trying to decide if I should, it's concluding thoughts here. There are all sorts of arguments whether we should have a mixed race churches or whether we should not. We actually asked Americans, should we? One third of them said they strongly agreed that we should have mixed race churches. We should work at that. Now these are all Americans, whether they go to church or not. One third kind of weakly agreed and one third did not agree. When we asked church-going people, people that went to church at least twice a month, we found the exact same thing. One third said yes, one third said well, yeah, maybe, and one third said no, we should not. It didn't vary by racial group. The only, the only variation was for African Americans. Half of African Americans at 10 church said we ought to integrate, but still a third said they didn't think we should. So there are all kinds of arguments for and against. And our country right now is really at a standstill on this whole issue. Should we be separate? Should we be together? And our answer just comes down to, well, whatever you choose, that's fine. So as leaders, I would have to say this, and I hear it from CCDA, and it's why it means so much to me personally, is that isn't, that isn't the way that we decide things. We look to see what God's Word says. God's Word says we should be together. So my prayer is that as the leaders, you'll go back and you'll live out God's words. And what I tell you I look forward to doing is hearing about the victories that God's bringing and watching the transformation of this racialized society. Thank you.